Hi, this is Dr. Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics, and welcome to the Radiographics Audio Summary Podcast. Each issue, I will be highlighting a few of our articles that I think are important. Gatotcetic acid, a hepatobiliary specific contrast agent used for liver MR, plays an important role in the characterization of hepatic masses. While lesions lacking functioning hepatocytes, such as most hepatocellular carcinomas, are hypointense on MR relative to background liver tissue, there are a variety of mechanisms whereby hepatic mass lesions can show partial or complete hyperintensity. Understanding the spectrum of imaging findings that may be encountered in such lesions, the underlying pathologic and genetic features, and the differential diagnosis of such enhancement is important when interpreting these studies. After reviewing the kinetics of gadotcetic acid in the liver and the hepatocellular transport of the agent by hepatocytes, the authors briefly address the limitations of gadotcetic acid relative to MR findings in LIRADS. Table 2 in the paper lists the advantages and disadvantages of gadotcetic acid as a liver imaging agent for MR. Improved detection of small lesions during hepatobiliary phase imaging is the primary advantage. Next is a review of those lesions that demonstrate gadotcetic acid uptake due to hyperplastic hepatocytes, beginning with focal nodular hyperplasia. Figures 2 through 4 illustrate a spectrum of FNH lesions, including large and small lesions, and lesions with central scars. FNH-like lesions that are the result of a hyperplastic response to cirrhotic changes have similar imaging characteristics to typical FNH lesions. The third hyperplastic lesion discussed is nodular regenerative hyperplasia, which is normal liver associated with underlying systemic diseases, including lymphoproliferative and myeloproliferative disorders, autoimmune disease, drug exposure, and Bud Chiari syndrome. The next group of hyperintense liver masses are those due to gadotcetic acid uptake by tumor cells, beginning with hepatocellular adenomas. Table 3 lists the four subtypes with corresponding imaging characteristics that are illustrated in figures 6 and 7 in the article. 10 to 15 percent of hepatocellular carcinomas, in particular those with preserved expression of OATP1B3, also known as green hepatomas, are hyperintense during hepatobiliary phase MR imaging. Figure 8 shows an example with pathologic correlation. The next group of hyperintense tumors are associated with retention of gadotcetic acid in the extracellular space. These include fibrotic tumors such as cholangiocarcinomas, 80% of which are hyperintense, metastatic adenocarcinomas, and hemangiomas. Peritumoral retention of agent due to hyperplastic hepatocytes surrounding a tumor is occasionally seen in HCCs and other tumors. Biliary tract enhancement is normal on delayed scans, and intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms of the biliary tract can be seen outlined by contrast that accumulates within dilated ducts. Visible enhanced non-dilated biliary ducts traversing a tumor should suggest hepatic lymphoma. Figure 16 shows a typical example. A summary section provides a diagram of the differential diagnosis of hyperintense liver masses seen during hepatobiliary phase imaging with gadotcetic acid. An accompanying commentary is provided by Dr. Naraj Lalwani from Wake Forest University Baptist Health. The chronic immunosuppression associated with solid organ and hematopoietic stem cell transplant performed for a variety of malignant and non-malignant conditions in children, place the transplant recipient at risk for a group of pre-malignant and malignant conditions collectively termed post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, or PTLD. This article from a group including radiologists, 
a pediatric hematologist oncologist, and a pathologist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, begins with a review of the pathogenesis of PTLD, which involves impaired Epstein-Barr virus-induced T-cell check on the B-cell proliferation that produces PTLD. Four pathologic subtypes of PTLD, which include non-destructive, polymorphic, monomorphic, and classic Hodgkin types of lymphoma, are then reviewed and illustrated. The majority of monomorphic B-cell PTLD fulfills criteria for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Table 1 in the article summarizes the PTLD subtypes reviewed in the article. After a discussion of the risk factors for and clinical presentation of patients with PTLD, the authors offer some general considerations on the imaging of pediatric patients with PTLD. Table 3 summarizes these recommendations, and Table 4 provides a summary of imaging features of PTLD on ultrasound, CT, MR, and FDG PET-CT. After reminding us to image gently in children with PTLD, the article briefly describes imaging features of nodal PTLD. FDG PET-CT appears to be the most accurate way to assess for PTLD. The imaging features of extranodal PTLD in children are then addressed in detail, beginning with abdominal and pelvic disease. In gastrointestinal PTLD, lesions range from simple nodules to large masses. Ulceration of intestinal masses is more common in PTLD than in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Solid organ involvement of the liver, spleen, and kidneys can show one of four imaging patterns, infiltrative, solitary mass, parenchymal or scattered, or obstructive patterns. PTLD of the mesentery and omentum can appear as discrete masses, infiltrative lesions, or direct extension of a lesion originating in an abdominal organ. Chest involvement is most often seen in lung transplant recipients. Solitary or multiple masses or airspace consolidation can be seen. PTLD lesions of the brain are usually poorly defined multicentric intraaxial cortical and subcortical masses with surrounding perilesional edema, hemorrhage, and necrosis. The extracranial head and neck most commonly involved includes the lymphoid tissue of the Waldeyer ring, adenotonsillar disease, and cervical lymph nodes in nodal disease. Other sites of involvement include muscle, bone marrow, skin, and breast. Conditions that can mimic PTLD include infections, acute rejection, graft-versus-host disease, and EBV-induced smooth muscle tumors. Treatment-related changes, such as diffuse skeletal muscle uptake of FDG, as can be seen with tacrolimus, an immunosuppressive drug, or subcutaneous tissue FDG uptake in patients on chronic corticosteroids, can be misinterpreted as PTLD. Regarding treatment response, there are two classification systems used, the Lugano and the RECIL criteria. The article concludes with sections on preventive therapies, treatment, and prognosis. One published study used pretreatment texture analysis in lymphoma patients to predict progression-free survival. From the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at Yale University School of Medicine comes this article on intravenous gadolinium-based contrast agents and nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, or NSF. The article begins with a review of the classification of eight commercially available gadolinium-based contrast agents divided into three groups based on their associated risk for NSF. These are summarized in Table 1. A description of the clinical manifestations of NSF is then provided. Fortunately, the incidence of NSF has been decreasing since 2010. There is a strong association with renal insufficiency, in particular the degree of impairment, such as the need for dialysis, rather than the duration or underlying cause of disease. The risk of NSF after 
gadolinium-based contrast agent exposure depends on which agent is used, with most cases reported after the use of non-ionic linear agents. Development of NSF appears to be dose-related. The dramatic reduction in new cases of NSF over the last decade may be the result of more routine screening for kidney disease, less use of gadolinium-based contrast agents that have been associated with the most cases of NSF in the past, particularly in patients with renal dysfunction, and less use of high-dose gadolinium-based contrast agent enhanced examinations, which were sometimes used in MR angiography. As a result, the ACR and ESUR suggest using the lowest possible dose of gadolinium-based contrast agent to obtain a diagnostic result. According to the ACR, if the patient is not at risk for NSF, there is no contraindication to giving multiple doses of any of the gadolinium-based contrast agents over a short period if the examinations are deemed clinically necessary. If the patient is at risk for NSF, the ACR recommends using a group 2, in other words, macrocyclic or nonlinear agent. Brain gadolinium deposition and retention, seen as T1 hyperintense signal in the dentate nuclei, globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and posterior thalamus in particular, has not to date been associated with clinical, behavioral, or biologic changes. The mechanism of gadolinium deposition in humans remains unclear, with several theories proposed. These are described in the article. The neuronal deposition of gadolinium has led the FDA and the European Medicines Agency to offer differing recommendations regarding gadolinium-based contrast agent use. While the FDA has decided not to restrict the use of specific gadolinium-based contrast agents, the EMA recommends suspension of the use of linear gadolinium-based contrast agents gadodiamide and gadoversetamide with the use of gadopentatate dimeglamine restricted to intraarticular injections for MR arthrography, as the dose used for this indication is low. In this article from three New York institutions, Dr. Zena Ritchie and colleagues provide a review of CT colonography artifacts and pseudolesions in an effort to optimize performance and interpretation of this minimally invasive screening test for colorectal cancer. The authors begin with a discussion of CT colonography artifacts, which are summarized in table format. Motion is one of the most common causes of artifact at CT colonography. Figure 1 shows a typical example on 2D and 3D CT images, while Figure 2 shows cardiac pulsation artifact affecting the subphrenic aspect of the left colon. Noise artifact is a particular problem in obese patients, and increasing tube current to improve resolution is appropriate in this situation. Metallic objects or dense contrast interfaces will produce streak artifact hip prostheses producing beam hardening in the pelvis at the level of the rectum is the most common cause. The gravitational flow of tagged intraluminal content during a CT colonography exam causes a hyperattenuating arciform starburst streak that has been termed the dense waterfall sign. Figure 6 shows an example. The final artifact reviewed is digital subtraction artifact which is unique to CT colonography that uses electronic cleansing technology in which tagged fluid is digitally subtracted. This can produce pseudopolypoid lesions on 3D images. The second section of the article addresses pseudolesions and pitfalls in interpretation. The list of pseudolesions that are described and illustrated is long. The rectal catheter tip causes a pseudolesion on 3D imaging that is easily identified on corresponding 2D images. Rectal folds that encircle the rectum can simulate a pedunculated polyp on axial images, but are readily identified as such on coronal reconstructions. Underdistended bowel and colonic spasm are usually identified 
by improvement of the affected segment seen in a different patient position. Retained stool can be problematic. Fecal tagging or translucency rendering can be helpful for correctly identifying non-mobile stool. Thickened folds and flexural pseudotumors can be correctly identified on multiplanar reformatted images. Gas bubbles and mucus strands are additional challenges that can be sorted out on CT colonography. A contrast material coated polyp can be mistaken for stool if the central soft tissue attenuation is not appreciated. Foreign bodies, ingested pills, and the ileocecal valve are additional challenges and the authors provide tips on correctly recognizing these entities. Poor fluid tagging, a fluid-filled lumen, prominent barium coating of the colonic mucosal surface, and extrinsic mass effect from extracolonic structures are reviewed. Pneumatosis cystoides coli, mimicking multiple adjacent polyps on 3D endoluminal renderings, should be easily recognized on 2D images. Inverted or impacted colonic diverticula, prolapsing mucosal polyps, and muscular hypertrophy can all mimic polyps. Diverticular stricture can mimic malignancy. Well-established 2D CT colonography findings that indicate a diverticular stricture are as follows. A, the presence of diverticula in the affected segment. B, involved segment length greater than 10 centimeters. C, preserved mucosal folds, and D, preserved sigmoid curvature. Two features strongly predicting malignancy are absence of diverticula in the affected segment and shouldering. Final pitfalls that present diagnostic challenges are appendiceal structures, including the appendiceal orifice and stump inversion or interception of the appendix, anastomoses, hernias containing colon, and segmental colonic mobility, leading to incorrect characterization of a polyp as mobile, non-tagged stool. With an increase in the number of individuals that identify as transgender anticipated, it is important for radiologists to be aware of breast imaging considerations for this population and to review optimal breast imaging approaches for transgender individuals. In this important article from authors in the Department of Radiology at New York University School of Medicine, Dr. Eugis Parikh and colleagues begin by reviewing the glossary of transgender terminology that radiologists need to be familiar with to properly communicate with and accurately describe the transgender population. Table 1 provides a summary of these terms. In transgender women, hormonal changes associated with the use of feminizing hormone in those undergoing gender affirmation produce varying breast development as illustrated on ultrasound and mammography. The relationship between hormone therapy and breast cancer risk is reviewed, in particular the data in transgender patients. Regarding screening, Current screening recommendations in the transgender female population vary according to the age of the individual and other risk factors, including the duration of hormone therapy. Generally, advocates recommend annual or biennial screening starting at age 50. A series of diagnostic situations encountered in transgender women are addressed. First, the diagnostic workup for an indeterminate finding after screening mammography should follow the same recommendations as those for the cisgender female population and may involve additional mammographic diagnostic views, ultrasound, and tissue sampling, if indicated. Palpable lumps are evaluated based on patient age, with ultrasound used in those under 30, mammography in those over 40, and either modality in patients 30 to 39 years of age. As breast augmentation is a common practice among transgender women, evaluation for silicone implant rupture should follow those recommended for cisgender patients. For transgender men, 
Hormonal therapy with testosterone changes breast composition with a reduction of glandular and adipose tissue and the formation of connective tissue. Removal of breast tissue is common in these individuals. Breast cancer risk from testosterone therapy remains unclear. In transgender men who have not undergone chest reconstructive surgery or breast reduction, both Fenway Health and the UCSF Center for Excellence for Transgender Health recommend following the same screening protocols as those for cisgender women, regardless of the use of hormone therapy. In transgender men who present with a clinical concern after top surgery, ultrasound may be helpful as an initial imaging approach. This is similar to the approach for evaluating a post-mastectomy clinical concern in a cisgender woman. The article concludes with a discussion of special considerations related to transgender individuals, including discrimination, harassment, socioeconomic barriers to health care, and breast imaging center staff awareness of issues unique to this population. Quantitative analysis of thin section CT datasets can assist in the accurate diagnosis and longitudinal assessment of diffuse lung disease, providing an index of disease severity and serving as a useful tool in evaluating disease progression and its response to treatment. This article reviews the basic concepts of quantitative CT analysis and model development, provides examples of clinical applications in diffuse lung disease, assesses challenges in the analysis and use of quantitative data as decision support in interpretation, and describes future directions for research. The article begins with a table that reviews the terminology used in quantitative assessment of diffuse lung disease. This is Table 1. Following a description of threshold-based and first-order statistical methods, that provide relatively crude measures of diffuse lung processes such as emphysema and pulmonary fibrosis, the article reviews higher order statistical methods that take into account the spatial relationship between voxels and the characterization of textual features of diffuse lung disease. The use of higher order machine learning quantitative tools is then detailed using two published systems data-driven textural analysis, or DTA, and Caliper. The clinical applications of these quantitative tools are the focus of the remainder of this paper. In COPD, threshold-based measures have typically been used to quantify emphysema. Standard methods include the percentage of total lung parenchyma below around minus 950 Hounsfield units and the 15th percentile technique. This latter parameter represents the threshold value in Hounsfield units for which 15% of all lung voxels have a lower attenuation value. Figure 3 shows an example of using threshold-based quantification of emphysema on a thin section CT. Higher order texture-based analysis may avoid some of the pitfalls of threshold-based methods, which are subject to variation due to technical factors and patient size. In particular, these textural tools, by segmenting the lung into small volumes of interest, are better at characterizing the regional distribution and morphology of emphysema, and better distinguish emphysema from other causes of low attenuation areas in the lung, such as air trapping, cystic lung disease, and honeycombing. Figure 4 shows how these texture-based CT quantification tools work in two patients, one with upper lobe predominant central lobular emphysema and another with lower lobe predominant panlobular emphysema. In idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, several texture-based approaches have been developed that can quantify the extent of fibrotic reticular change and assess change over time. Figure 5 shows an example. Other fibrotic and obstructive diseases, including chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, connective tissue-related interstitial lung disease, and lymphangioliomyomatosis may benefit from quantitative assessment. 
Research on the use of textual analysis in these disease entities, particularly the longitudinal assessment of disease progression, are cited in this article. There are a number of challenges and limitations to the use of these quantitative methods in patients with diffuse lung disease. They include variations in the technical parameters of CT scans, inspiratory effort, inadequate extraction of thoracic structures to allow isolation of lung parenchyma for analysis, and inadequate training of computer algorithms. Thank you for listening. I hope you found these summaries helpful. Please subscribe to our podcasts and rate us on iTunes. This helps your colleagues find us much more easily. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you.